All right, we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest, the summer edition of SCOTUS Chat. Today is the big abortion update. I'm Erin McQuaid. I'm the Advocacy Director at Gender Justice. With me today is... I'm Jess Braverman. I'm the Legal Director at Gender Justice, and we are so excited about our special guest, Cece, please introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. I'm Cece Cocolette, and I'm a legal fellow at Gender Justice and super excited to be with you today for the SCOTUS chat. Woohoo! So we are going to be talking about the recent, although not this week, but, you know, who announces a decision like right before Memorial Day? Um, the recent Supreme Court decision to hear a case is called Dobbs v. Jackson. And so I'm going to turn it over to Jess to talk a little bit about what this case is. Um, and why we're concerned about it. Yeah. So just, can you give, actually walk us just a little very bit briefly. the background? Like, <laughs> well, well, tell me a little bit of the background on, like the Supreme Court decided to hear a case. What does that mean? Like how, tell me what that means. The Supreme Court hears very few cases that are presented to it. So lots of people go through the court system and then they reach this point where they don't like the outcome. And then they, they might say, okay, the next court I have to review this is the Supreme Court of the United States of America. And so lots of people ask them to hear their issue and the Supreme Court grants very few of these. Um, that's what you, you'll hear a lot about cert, cert petition, granting cert. What that means is a cert petition is where someone asks the court to review their case. And when the court grants cert, they've agreed to review the case. Um, normally it doesn't take them like a million years to make this decision. This is like gotta be a record. Like it's one of the longest times where a request to hear an issue has sat and sat and sat. It's um, been like three years, right? I, I don't know if it's been that long, but it's been a, it's been a while. I mean, you could be right. It's been, a, it's been much longer than usual. It's, it's a while. Um, I'll just be right. The, the, yeah, no, I mean, you usually are, so I wouldn't doubt it. Um, the, the courts generally take issues where there's um, a big issue that's raised and there's what's called a circuit split, meaning different federal courts have come out differently on some mm. issue and the Supreme Court hasn't given guidance. They take all these issues and they, they resolve and them. They're like going to settle it. Yeah, they're going to settle it. Um, they yeah. might take like new questions of like a new law passed. Someone tried to block it who's right, who's wrong, is this unconstitutional, right? It's a constitutional challenge to a, to a law. You know, there's stuff they take, but they don't generally like rehear issues that they've already heard over and over again because of there's this thing called stare decisis, which is the idea that like they've made a decision, you can rely on this decision, it's been around, we're not gonna like re redo this all the time. Like we've already ruled on this, we're not. So. That's like one. if they were going to take up a case about like interracial marriage, can they do it? Like, they, they, yeah, we they already could. decided that. Yeah, right. They, they could, yeah. but like it's been, de it's been decided. Um, and so that's some background that I think is helpful to know when we go into this next part. Um, okay. So they don't take a lot of cases. If they take a case, it's because it's like, this is a question we have not answered. Like the lower courts are split. We're going to take it. We're going to decide. We're going to answer this question. We get to Dobbs v. Jackson. What's the question? So in Dobbs versus Jackson's Women Health, Women's Health Organization, the question is whether all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional. Um, so that is whether states can constitutionally prohibit abortion prior to about 24 weeks of pregnancy. Um, and like Jess said, the court usually only takes cases where there's an outstanding question, and here there really isn't one. This has been settled law for about 50 years that the state <laughs> can't do this, um, and yet we're going to hear the question again. And so they're, they're going to, like, why would they do that? Like, is that why this is a big deal? Is it because they've already answered this question, now they're like, eh, we're going to take it up again? That's yeah. the concern, yeah. And so can you tell me a little bit about why, why is the question about pre-viability or like before 24 weeks for abortion? Why is it about that and not like all abortion or, you know, a different week of abortion or whatever? Uh, Cece, do you want to take this or do you want me to jump in? Jess, you've got it with the trimesters and viability. Go for it. Oh, sure. <laughs> so you may recall a, a little known case, Roe v. Wade. Um, it's, it's the case from back in the 70s where the court, there, there was a ban on abortion in Texas. Uh, they prohibited abortion at any stage of pregnancy except to save the life of the 
the parent, I mean, they would say mother, but we all know it's not only people who identify as mothers who get pregnant. Um, they, they rule that, you know, there's a constitutional right to privacy, and that includes um, a decision of whether to terminate a pregnancy. Um, that doesn't mean, what they said was it doesn't mean the state can't make any laws about abortion, but there are limitations on what the state can do in the area of abortion. Um, so one stage that, that, that they talked about in Roe v. Wade was like the first trimester. Basically, they said in the first trimester, there can be um, no interference. Um, then they said for after the first trimester, the state can regulate in ways that are related to maternal health, um, mm -hmm. but it has to be limited to maternal health. After viability, um, the state has a compelling interest in the potentiality of human life. And they can, they can basically do what they want to kind of regulate or ban abortion um, except, to, except they have to allow it to save the, the life or health of the parent or of the pregnant person, excuse me. Um, and so they kind of had this split of like first trimester and then viability with different interests. So, you know, when you hear Roe v. Wade, a lot of people say it's a constitutional right to abortion. Th this is how the court kind of laid it out, but that did change. Um, hmm. And so, I mean, the, the original case that went to the Supreme Court that got us Roe was an abortion ban. Now they're going to hear about an abortion ban. Have they heard any cases about abortion ban in the ensuing 53 years? Or however many years, 50 some years. CC, do you want to take this? They have not. So that's part of the reason folks are so concerned is this is the first abortion ban since Roe that the Supreme Court's going to take up. Um, there have mm -hmm. been other abortion cases, but those have been more about restrictions um, so Whole Women's Health v. Hellerstedt and June Medical are both about targeted restrictions on abortion providers, um, but the Supreme Court hasn't heard a ban case. And so that's part of the thought that maybe they're taking this up to weaken or overturn Roe. Mm. And so um, I actually, so this is really interesting to me because I think a lot of times when we think about the courts, we think, especially the Supreme Court of the United States, we think it's the federal government, it's the federal court, um, and the implications are you know, wide reaching, right? It's the every state in the nation that could potentially be affected. But it really is like this starts in states. How did we get this Supreme Court grant of cert or whatever? It's because of a law from what state? Like, tell me what happened in Mississippi. It's Mississippi. Let me take you all the way back. Thank you. Uh, so in March of 2018, Mississippi passed this 15 week abortion ban. And to be clear, this is 15 weeks after the first day of your last menstrual period. Which um, is not, okay. Sorry. Yeah, yep, no, go do this. That's not, that's not how people get pregnant. Okay. There are like three stages to pregnancy. You have to ovulate. You have to have like you have sperm that goes into an egg, whether that happens in a Petri dish or in a person's body. Um, and then it has to be implanted into a uterus. If you are ovulating within your own body and sperm is going into your body, then that is a two week process. It's not two weeks from the last time you, you menstruated. It's two weeks from when the sperm and the ovum met in the fallopian tube, they got about two weeks to implant in the uterus. So that's ridiculous. Go on. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Um, so Mississippi passes this law. Mississippi has had only one abortion clinic for about 10 years now. Mm. Um, so the law is passed and went into effect in March of 2018. And within hours, the lawyers for this clinic and for one of their providers went to court um, and got an immediate temporary restraining order. So the law was blocked. This law has never gone into effect none of these weak related abortion bans have ever gone into effect. Um, so the case went on a while longer in November of 2018, the district court in Mississippi issued a permanent injunction keeping the law blocked and Mississippi appealed. Um, so then in 2019, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals heard the case, they upheld the injunction and they said that the 15 week ban was unconstitutional. Um, and like we've said, this was no surprise, right? The central holding of Roe is that states can't ban abortion before viability Viability is around 24 weeks. This is 15 weeks. Any ban before then is per se unconstitutional. Um, so that's how the law has been for 50 years. That's exactly what the Fifth Circuit said. Um, but one of the Fifth Circuit judges, Judge Ho, filed a concurring opinion, basically saying, you know, this is the law. I know what I have to do. But oh, my God, I hate it so much. Uh, Supreme Court, please change the law so that I don't have to do this. Um, so Mississippi appealed to the Supreme Court in June of 2020. And like Jess said, the court sat on it for a long time, um, which is pretty weird. You have to have four justices agree to take a case. 
And so with that delay, a lot of folks thought that the court, they didn't have the votes, right? And the court wouldn't hear it, but that one of the justices was writing a long dissent. Um, but that's not what happened. So the court is going to take the case. They're going to hear it in the next term. So probably arguments in October or November, and then anticipating a decision about a year from now in June of 2022. So just yeah, a right quick... before that. Yeah, oh, go no. ahead. Okay, so just like, say... please, Aaron. No, no, no. I was going to say right before they hightail it out of town, they like drop the most controversial decisions and they leave. That's what I was yep. going to say. Summer break. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, go ahead, Jeff. No, it's totally true. Um, and, and what I was going to say is like, just, just to recap, like since the time of Roe, it has been clear, no confusion, no circuit split, like the, the court of the land has ruled that you, you know, you cannot prohibit abortion pre viability. No one has argued that 15 weeks is, um, like post viability, like no, like there's nothing like that going on. It's literally, everyone has said, this is a pre viability ban. Mississippi just wants to do it. And they're looking to upend over 50 years of precedent. So why 15 weeks? That's not really a, a, the way that uh, pregnancy progresses, right? We It's in months. And so it's like four weeks and then it's three months. And then, you know, so like 15 weeks is like not, why 15 weeks? It's a great question. Um, part you. of it is Mississippi specific. Um, like we said, they only there's only one abortion provider in Mississippi, and they provide abortion care up to 16 weeks. Um, ah, so, so this right. is to eliminate abortion in Mississippi, just, you know. Well, and no ban. reason for anti-abortion advocates to do a 20-week ban when there's not care up to 20 weeks, right? Sure. Okay. Um, the flip side of this is that the 15-week ban was a test case developed by the Alliance Defending Freedom, who I know are one of your favorite groups. No, I really despise them with everything I have in my entire being and they're horrible people and literally nobody should ever listen to their legal advice. It will cost you money and harm people. Don't listen to them. They're horrible. Continue. So yeah, they, they developed this 15 week ban as a test case thinking that abortion advocates maybe wouldn't challenge a 20 week ban. Um, so going for 15 instead, you know, every single one of these bans that has been challenged has been blocked. So we probably would have, but Yes, 20 weeks is also not viability. Precisely. Um, and I think there's also a thought that some of these six week bans that we're seeing crop up in places like Mississippi and Texas are a little bit too draconian to be the first case in the Supreme Court. Like 15 mm. might be more palatable and then they'll just work back and back and back towards a de facto total abortion ban. Well, and it's, it's not like anti-abortion extremists have been quiet about what they wanna do, right? We have seen, this is the worst year in over a decade for abortion rights in the United States. We have had 536, this was like in April, so it's probably more now, um, abortion restrictions introduced with like 36 bans in 46 states. So like they're trying to ban abortion. This is, it's just like, it's so wild to watch it happen like out loud in real time and then have like Supreme Court justices that be like, we should ban abortion. I will call balls and strikes. Like I, it's so weird. Like we know what they're doing, we know why. They want to do it. And it's like the end game has been said over and over and over again. And we're just supposed to like play along like there's arguments that they're listening to. Anyway, off that soapbox. Um, continue on. No, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And, and we're seeing bills that are getting increasingly scary, like this Texas bill that's a six week ban, plus would allow just like any person off the street to sue anyone else for assisting someone in seeking abortion care. You know, if right. you give somebody a ride to the doctor, you could be sued. Um, you give them directions right. to the clinic. Right, who knows how far that could go, you know, not to catastrophize too much, but like they're very much saying the quiet part out loud at this point. Right, and it's, it's intended to not only um, criminalize, like right, make abortion illegal, but also criminalize pregnancy outcomes, right? So let's say abortion is fully illegal in the United States of America, and then you have a miscarriage. Well, now they're going to take you to court to be like, prove that you didn't have an abortion. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually already happened. That happened in Alabama shortly after they passed their abortion ban. So it is, it is intended to criminalize pregnancy outcomes and, you know, control people with uteruses as always. Um, okay. So I, I wanna, like, this is gonna go off topic, not off topic, out of our, our outline a little bit, but like talk about the Supreme Court and the makeup of the Supreme Court and why why is this bill, or you know, there's a bunch of them that are in the queue, but why is it this court that uh, people are excited about? Excited? I mean, excited, sorry. This court that anti-abortion extremists are excited about having their case heard in front of. Oh, that they're excited, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, 
so the, the makeup of the court has obviously shifted. We know um, during the early days of the pandemic, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed um, and Amy Connie Barrett was quickly confirmed in her place. So that, and Amy Connie Barrett is, you know, she's, she's, this is hard to, there, there's this like falsehood, you know, people go, they go to get confirmed as, as a Supreme Court judge and they say like, I'm not gonna, I can't tell you how I'd rule on a hypothetical case. I can't say, I can't say, right? So they often might not tell you what they would do with an abortion case, but you kind of know what they wanna do. Um, Amy Connie Barrett had signed on, had signed on to things opposing Roe, opposing the right to an abortion. Um, she is, um, her religious beliefs we know are, are against abortion. Um, I mean, we have a whole SCOTUS chat about her and yeah. specifically about what her beliefs are. It's, and, um, it, she's not been silent about it. No. And it's not the case that every judge, you know, there's Catholic judges on the bench, there's Jewish judges, judges on the bench. We don't know how they personally feel about abortion necessarily, but, you know, we have good enough reason to think she's an originalist. Um, Scalia was an originalist. There's judges on the bench who are originalists. They look to the original meaning of the constitution. Um, what they say is the original meaning based on what the founders thought at the time. And um, a lot of folks in that camp argue that the abortion right just doesn't exist in the constitution. And that's the camp of judicial learning and, and decision-making that she comes from. Um, well, yes. How weird that people who look to people who are slave owners and didn't believe women should have rights. Uh, it's wild that they don't think that abortion should exist. I mean, it's a pretty logical jump from that racist stuff. Continue. Yeah, so so she so she's on the bench now. We also have um, Kavanaugh, who I think is also not a big fan of the abortion right. Um, Alito and Thomas have been on for a long time, and both of them have just overtly like anytime the issue comes up, they're like, "There's no right to an abortion." Like, I don't know about Alito. Thomas has dissented on like, I mean, they both dissented, right? But Thomas, I think, dissents on every abortion case, basically saying there is no constitutional right to an abortion. Oh, he it's also says like, that abortion is eugenics, which is not how eugenics works. So a great way to have eugenics is to not let people decide to do what, what they want to do with their bodies. Uh, continue. So, so at the time of, of Hellerstead, you kind of had, I think like Roberts was the cent, like he, you know, he voted in favor of the clinics. He voted against the abortion bans uh, or they weren't abortion bans. He voted against the abortion restrictions, but now the, the court has shifted further to the right since, since then. Um, and yeah, the center yeah. is like, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so it's, um, so people are worried the makeup of the court is not good for abortion rights um, or for stare decisis, right? Like they're, it's not a great makeup for people who are like, let's not overturn prior precedent. Let's let people rely on the rights yeah. they have. And yeah. Yeah. This court has been really into overturning precedent. Um, I've noticed with my sharp legal eye. Um, I, so one of the questions that I do have is um, there are nine justices on the Supreme Court, and I, six of them have to agree to take the case. Four of them. How many have to say we should answer this question in order for it to happen? Four have to agree to take the case, um, but it would have to but be five four, or six to overturn. Okay, so what four agreed to take this case? Oh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we know. I don't think. Oh. Yeah, I could be. I could be wrong about this, but I don't think they say who voted. Mm -hmm. Right, it would have to be at least four. So it's possible yeah. that six voted to take it. Mm. I, I could be wrong. I don't normally, I don't normally follow that, that stat, if you will. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they don't say. Okay. Um. So, okay. So we have 15 week abortion ban. The, the question that the court is going to answer is, are all pre-viability abortion bans unconstitutional? What are the possible answers to that question that they could come, that they could come out with? Well, <laughs> that has some incisive legal reasoning on this. Point. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, P I mean, yeah. Cece, do you want do you want to start, or do you want do you want me to? No, you go ahead. Okay, I think that there's um, there's a few ways things could go. I know there's definitely people in the camp of like, why would they hear this if they're not going to overturn the constitutional right to an abortion? I don't know. I don't know what folks on this video think. I'm not. I'm not quite there. It's possible. I'm not quite there. Um, but, you know, the alternatives are not great. Um, this could be, you know, one thing I'm thinking is basically what, what the court said in Roe is basically like pre-viability 
um, states just don't have an interest. Like if a state, pa- the states can't just pass whatever laws they want. They have to have a reason for doing it. And how, how like much a court will scrutinize that reason depends on like what that law is about. And if the law impacts a constitutional right, the court's really going to scrutinize that law carefully. Um, and so the, the, with, with the courts and, and the state has to have an interest in passing a law. So what the court basically said in Roe was like pre-viability, the state does not have an interest in, in restrict, you know, in, in prohibiting abortion. Like you just don't, there's, there's nothing you could tell me that would make me say like, sure, go ahead. Um, what, what states are allowed to do now is to pass laws that are like to protect the pregnant person's health. And I put that in quotes because often the laws don't do that, right? It's, you know, you have to have admitting privileges in a hospital 10 feet away from your door. You know, it's stuff that's like not necessary. Abortion's really safe. It makes it impossible. Abortion is safe. It yeah. is safer than having right. a tooth extracted. It is safer than having a colonoscopy medication. Abortion is safer than over-the-counter ibuprofen. Abortion right. is safe. Continue. Right. So, so what, the, what the court basically said was like, there's no state interest that you can have that will justify a pre-viability ban on abortion. So we're just not going to let you do it. The court could change that component and say like, there is a constitutional right to abortion, but the states might have an interest in banning earlier than we thought. And, and we think that states should be allowed to pursue that. And if you have an issue, you bring it to the court and the state should be able to put on their case about what their serious interest is. Um, so you think, a, so sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Well, I don't know that that's what's going to happen. It's a, it's a possible way for them to kind of rule where they don't overturn Roe. They don't overturn Roe. They don't mm-hmm. overturn the idea that there's a constitutional right, but they just turn the, the litigation field into like a bigger hellscape than it already is mm-hmm. because states can just like kind of be like well we think you know like i found a wackadoo more, doctor who said that yeah it gives them a little more time. leeway to to like right now they're if they're passing laws they have to show that it has you know it has some relation to like the health of the um of, of the pregnant person and and that the, yeah. it's not like the burdens don't outweigh those benefits um now, if they do what I'm suggesting is a possibility, I'm not saying this is going to happen. If they do what right. I'm suggesting is a possibility, it gives them more leeway, like way more reasons. They could say like, you know, things related to the, the potential light fetal, whatever it may mm-hmm. be. Um, and just kind of go from there, which really like broadens the, the reasons they're allowed to legislate. Again, I'm not saying that would happen. It would overturn decades of precedent. It would be the wrong opinion, but it's basically saying like right now there is a huge hurdle in front of abortion bans at at pre-viability before Mm -hmm. 24 weeks. And what you're saying is there's a potential they could just remove that outright barrier and poke some holes in it and be like, well, and I think you said earlier too, that, you know, when this case was going through the lower court, they weren't arguing about anything about pre-viability, right? It was like, that was not part of the discussion and so they could come back and say actually let's have that conversation and and like open the door to pass laws and then bring it back to us and we'll tell you if it's right or not kind of like that yeah what the court said at the lower level and and they're right is like you just can't ban abortion pre-viability so the only question we're going to talk about is is 15 weeks pre-viability and no one's okay. arguing that it's not right so Got there's it. no there's no like the state wanted to bring in evidence of things like fetal pain and other things and the court was like no 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 like it's settled law you just cannot ban abortion pre-viability so the only thing we're going to talk about is is this or is this not pre-viability we all agree it's pre-viability so like we don't need to go on um, mm. oh it just like it's so sobering right like i am a joyous buoyant person and then like we talk about this and I'm like oh god this is terrible and they spent so they spent decades creating bogus you know federalist societies and like handpicking these judges and creating all of this like stuff to shove these justices and these judicial appointments like they stole a supreme court seat they like packed the court and so twice probably anyway it's just like like knowing that the worst people in the world like put people who can make this decision in place is like scary. Well, let's talk about like a bad thing and then a good thing. Yes, let's talk okay. about a good thing. The, Go the bad, the bad, 
the bad thing is, is CC, do you want to talk a little bit about, let's say, I'm not saying this will happen, right? You're going to hear a lot of people saying Rose going to be overturned, Rose going to be overturned. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I don't know. It's possible. Could it could be effectively overturned, right? It could be like they don't formally overturn. Like there's lots of bad outcomes that could happen. But let's just say the court were to say there's no constitutional right to an abortion. Can you talk a little bit about what will happen specifically like around Minnesota? Not not in Minnesota, around Minnesota. Wait, can I, before she talks about around Minnesota, can I say yes. what happens in Minnesota? In Minnesota. Wait, but, but that's the good thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, Cece, then you go. Save okay, so here's, but here's we'll little... save, we're going to save the good one for you. So a little bit of, a little bit of gloom um, before the bright spot. So if, if the court were to overturn Roe v. Wade, that would not necessarily mean that abortion is illegal in the United States. It would mean that states then have the authority to decide what to do about abortion in their state. Um, and as we've seen, like there are some state legislatures not necessarily the people in those states, but the state legislatures that are like raring to go to see how bad this could get. So, you know, from January 1st of this year to the day before the Supreme Court agreed to hear this case, there have been 165 abortion bans introduced in 47 states. Again, none of them are in effect, but if things go a little bit haywire in Dobbs, some of them could be. Um, And some states have what are called trigger laws Um, which generally say something to the effect of, you know, if Roe v. Wade is overturned, abortion will automatically become illegal in this state, no further action required. Um, 11 states, including Mississippi, have these right now. Texas, the Texas legislature just tried to pass one last week. Um, And so the the area around Minnesota is looks a little bleak. And if if the court were to overturn Roe v. Wade, Um, so North and South Dakota both have anti-abortion trigger laws on the books. Um, And notably for those laws, Roe wouldn't need need to be fully overturned. It would just need to be the Supreme Court restoring state authority to prohibit abortion. Um, Wisconsin doesn't have a trigger law per se. They do have a pre-Roe ban on the books, which isn't enforced now, but maybe could be depending on how things go. Um, And Iowa has an unconstitutional abortion ban that was passed post-Roe and has been permanently enjoined by courts, has never gone into effect Um, but depending on the outcome of this case, it could sort of open the floodgates for a good amount of nonsense. Um, And I think they're trying to put a a constitutional amendment on their ballot in Iowa because their Supreme Court just did something that our Supreme Court did 25 years ago. Quite right. What was that? So in 1995. um, This this is the good part, right? We're going to talk about something good now? Okay. So should something happen in Dobbs? Um, In Minnesota, we have the legal right to abortion per the Minnesota Constitution. And when the Minnesota Supreme Court ruled on this in 95 in Dovey uh, Gomez, they said the Minnesota Constitution provides broader protections than the United States Constitution um, over a person's decision to obtain an abortion or carry to term. So no matter what happens in Dobbs, abortion is legal in Minnesota. We have a constitutional protection to it. And what, what Jess was saying before about, you know, there's different levels of scrutiny Um, And when it's a constitutional right, they have a a really high scrutiny. That's the level of scrutiny that they provide to abortion restrictions in the state of Minnesota. Also part of Doe v. Minnesota, the lawsuit that we're doing to remove the abortion restrictions. Because the landscape means, right, is if if something happens and we have North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, and I think Michigan also has a pre or post row ban, although I don't know, I don't know the details of that law. Um, Minnesota would be the only place in the upper Midwest where pregnant people can access the full spectrum of pregnancy care. And even though it's legal here in Minnesota and we have constitutional protections for it, we still don't have that great of access. We have very few uh, clinics. We have a whole host of restrictions. And so, you know, like being uh, legal, but pretty inaccessible is not the standard we want in, in Minnesota. And so that's part of why we do the work that we do. But it is a bright spot to know that in Minnesota, um, we would have access to the full spectrum of pregnancy care at select clinics, many hours away, depending on where you live. Um, yeah. So, so, so what, what Aaron's saying, which is the good news is like, we're protected in our state constitution. The nothing the Supreme court says in Dobbs is going to impact our state constitutional protections. And so that's fantastic. And we're hoping to further strengthen those protections. We've got our lawsuit, Dovey, Minnesota, where we're trying to get rid of some of the abortion restrictions, some of which have been on the books for years and years and years. Um, and yeah, so, and no matter what happens in Dobbs v. Jackson, we, we still have those state protections, which is really yeah. good. And the work continues, right? Because mm-hmm. like, it, it frustrates me sometimes to talk about like, 
the, the rights that we have, like every person should be able to decide whether and when they become pregnant or not pregnant and whether they have a family or not. Like that is a, a right that belongs or should belong to all of us, regardless of what the court, the fact that we have to fight for that, that's what I think is really infuriating that we have to like get up and be like, hey, just so you know, like I'm a person too. Like I should get to decide what I do with my body. Um, that's infuriating, but it, it's why we do this work. So we're, we're trying to get the courts to recognize rights we should already have. Um, yeah. So, so there's a few great organizations we can lift up right now, I think. Um, to, to close this out. Um, one is gender justice, <laughs> genderjustice.us. Um, another one, I love these folks, Just the Pill. That's, they're a local provider. They, they travel around the state providing abortion, which is, a, which is amazing because right now all of the clinics are on the east side of the state. Um, I love any excuse to email them. They're, they're awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, and they do really great work. Um, and uh, yeah, supporting them is always a good one. Um, Our Justice, your local abortion fund, another mm -hmm. great organization to support. There's the We Health Clinic in Duluth. There, there's lots of amazing organizations. And Whole Woman's support. Health in, Whole Woman's in Bloomington. Health. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. There's a lot of amazing organizations in Minnesota who are trying to make sure that, um, you know, ac access is a reality, that people can make this decision, that they can get like compassionate care. Um, and so, yeah, look, look them up, send, send money their send way. Them some bucks. Send us yes, some and, and go and to donuts Harvard our way, Street. send money. Yes, send donuts. Donuts accept, us, yeah. Yeah. Jess accepts all forms of payment in donuts. It's been very oh. awkward for some of our like they pay, payment. Gender justice pays my salary in donuts and yeah. yeah. Um, just like Homer Simpson. Um, <laughs> no, uh, Unrestrict Minnesota is our coalition where we are working to protect and expand access to abortion care and all health care, reproductive health care in the state of Minnesota. Please go to unrestrictmn.org where you can learn more about our work and all of our partners, including the ones that Jess just listed and many, many more. It's one of those things where it's like, if I had that many kids, I'd never start thanking them because there's like, there's like 27 community partners. I'll never, I'll like forget the last one or something. So We'll just send everybody to the partner page. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Jess and Cece for, you know, explaining things to my non-lawyer brain. And uh, we will be back, I am sure, with more SCOTUS news with a SCOTUS chat. Have a good night, everybody. Enjoy your summer. Happy Pride. Bye-bye.